Welcome to Ones and Twos Foreign Policies Economics Podcast, where every week we take two different data points and tell you how they explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor, sitting in Berlin. As always, our resident expert, Adam Twos, is in New York. Hi, Adam. Hi, good to be here. So let's jump right into the news headlines. It's been a really busy week, and the number that I had in mind is 300 billion. That's the number of dollars of debt that a Chinese real estate company by the name of Evergrande currently has on its books, and it seems like it might be on the verge of defaulting. And so we are actually looking at probably one of the most significant debt restructurings of all time. Some investors turned up at the company's headquarters in Shenzhen last week, demanding answers. And that potential bankruptcy has caused financial turmoil across the world, including in the United States, where stock markets dropped almost 2%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gave up 614 points to close at 33,970. The loss of 1.8% was the worst since July. The Nasdaq fell. So, I want to understand how a Chinese real estate company can end up shaking US stock markets so badly. But first I got to start with the question that's probably on people's minds just from real estate bankruptcies on the horizon, contagion. Uh, it just sounds like Lehman Brothers in 2008. Uh, is that what we're looking at here with Evergrande? Yeah, this, this question's really been scaring people. It's been all over the media, all over the web. I mean, even the Chinese business press has, has uh, been running you know, headlines along these lines. They have had a property bubble worse than anyone else in the world. Evergrande has borrowed money from just about everyone. It's extraordinary how widely spread its liabilities are. So the, the worry really is contagion. It's not so much Evergrande itself as the fear and sort of financial distress that could spread out from that one company and could become a, a sort of self-sustaining wildfire. But so far, that the betting is that it will be no Lehman. It'll be contained. Um, ultimately, the financial system in China is too directly backed by the state for this to spiral into a series of banking crises. A lot of people are going to get hurt, but it's unlikely to become a systemic shock. OK, that kind of sounds a little bit reassuring, um, but let's figure out what exactly happened here. Evergrande is a real estate company, and somehow it borrowed up to $300 billion. I mean, this wasn't like a Madoff-style Ponzi scheme. They really did build apartments and homes in China. Oh, yeah. I mean, Evergrande is like absolutely for real. They currently have about 1300 projects in 280 cities across China. China is enormous and they specialize in the sort of second tier, third tier, the slightly less favored cities. At the end of June, they had prepayments, commitments, down payments from about 1.5 million unfortunate people to build apartments for them. And the Chinese make big initial deposits on projects like this. So it's a group also that went far beyond home building. It was into electric vehicles, internet, media production, a theme park, a soccer club, a mineral water and food company. I mean, that's the whole works. Um, it has 200 offshore and almost 2,000 domestic subsidiaries. So no, this is a, this is a real proposition. Uh, the bankruptcy of Evergrande will impact communities across China and beyond. I mean, but still, even 300 billion dollars to me sounds just as an outsider like uh something was overpriced here so i mean what were the investors thinking why did they all think that this was a good investment to hand this much money over to evergrande because you were basically placing a bet on a huge and rapidly growing pool of wealth probably the most dramatic story of wealth accumulation of the 21st century arguably perhaps of any period um, in 1998 only a third of Chinese lived in towns and cities. Now almost two thirds do. So that's 480 million people that moved from the countryside to the city. And 1998 is significant because that's also the moment when China basically introduced a system of private land ownership. So half a billion Chinese suddenly got the chance to own something, moved to the cities. And the question is, do you want to be part of that business? And it's a no brainer. I mean, it's absolutely the biggest game in the world. 
Furthermore, because of what's called financial repression, Chinese households didn't really have much else to invest in. So 80% of China's household wealth is in real estate, as opposed to maybe 30% of American household wealth. And about 90% of Chinese families that live in cities own their own homes. Now, these aren't homes in the sense that Americans understand them. They're much more European. They have about 400 square feet per person. So they're modest apartments. But when you add all of this up, it's a gigantic pot of money. I mean, it's $50 trillion, according to the calculation of Goldman Sachs. And you know why they're doing the math on the number. This is a huge business. And it's not just firms and it's not just households. It's entire the entire structure of politics in China especially local government, depends on this because also in the 90s, they passed sort of balanced budget rules for local government in China. They're not really allowed to borrow. And when we say local government in China, we're talking cities with millions of inhabitants, huge provinces. So what they do instead is they sell off land to developers like Evergrande, or what they do is they use the land as collateral for off-balance sheet borrowing. So essentially, All of China's growth miracle, at least 20%, perhaps more of the entire growth story of recent years, is this real estate drive. And unsurprisingly, yes, investors from all around the world wanted a piece of this. Okay, so it sounds like the Chinese government encouraged this to begin with, or they maybe even like blew up the bubble, maybe to use that metaphor. But then why is it popping now? What led to this crisis right now? I mean, in terms of house price to average income ratio, so the the affordability, Beijing is now probably the least affordable city in the world, along with Shanghai, Shenzhen and Hong Kong. So it's it's four times less affordable in terms of the ratio of the average property to the average income than New York or San Francisco. And it's twice as bad as, as London. So this forces Chinese households to take on much more debt than you would expect on the relatively modest levels of income that they've got. And on top of that, they have to make huge down payments. So it forces a sort of excessive savings culture. So Chinese regulators of the People's Bank of China have been signaling for some time now that they really want to rein this in. And they've in fact been targeting Evergrande for a while. In 2018, they singled out the firm as as one they thought was over leveraged. And then in 2020, they introduced a whole battery of restrictions, which basically cut Evergrande and several other real estate developers out of the borrowing market. There was even a letter leaked and then then denied, but it was out there and it's caused panic that the local government authorities, the provincial authorities would not stand behind Evergrande if it got into trouble. So they have been trying to prick this bubble for a while now. Okay, so the Chinese government has stepped in and they're going to force the issue. But I guess that raises the question of who is going to be the big loser here. I mean, on one hand, you described kind of domestic investors, uh, the Chinese middle class saver who's putting all his money into real estate. On the other hand, we have all the foreign investors, uh, you know, including the US stock markets. So who's going to be the big loser here? What's going to happen? In the end, we think the foreign exposure to Evergrande is, is about 20 billion. And in terms of who gets paid here, well, China's never been through a workout like this before. They may very well try and avoid it coming to a formal bankruptcy, which would then require very complicated court proceedings. There's going to be litigation. I mean, you can see if you read the Chinese business press, they're actually scavenging and scouring through the provincial court records to figure out who already is suing Evergrande to get paid back. I think the betting is that the regime will try and ensure that small savers, the people who put down deposits, that they get paid because the regime is deeply interested in in social stability. You'd have to figure that the foreign lenders are the people who were brave enough to put money in, that they'll be last in the queue. If you know, word on the street in Hong Kong is like, how who would have been crazy enough to lend money to Evergrande? What we've discovered, the Financial Times reported on this recently, that is that even BlackRock was in fact still snapping up. Not billions, but millions of dollars worth of Evergrande bonds as recently as a few weeks ago. And BlackRock is uh, is who exactly? BlackRock is the largest asset manager in the world with, I mean, over $8 trillion. So in a sense, you could say they've got so much money, they have to put it somewhere. And some of it went into what's called euphemistically high-yielding Chinese debt. And it turns out that some of that was Evergrande. I guess I want to end with a kind of historical question because... I don't know. It seems to me that we've been having just a lot of real estate bubbles recently. I mean, uh, the United States a few years ago, Spain, Ireland, and now China. So I don't know. What is it about real estate? Have homes always been the source of these kinds of 
crazy financial bubbles or are these just kind of saying something about us? They really have been. I mean, if you go back in the annals of capitalism back to the 16th century, 17th century, even there you can see speculative bubbles based on real estate. I think it comes down to the fact that essentially we can't do without it. We've got to have somewhere to live and you've got to have a base for commercial activity. And it makes excellent collateral. You can seize it and resell it. And as a result of that, it really has been the driver of financial growth and financial speculation from the very beginning Credit Suisse, which is a Swiss bank, which you know has a big wealth management practice, estimates that the total pool of wealth worldwide is three hundred and sixty trillion dollars. So that's everything, you know, financial claims of all kinds, bank accounts, and of that three hundred and sixty trillion, it figures that two hundred and eighty trillion is real estate. Now, so that's essentially two thirds of the whole thing. In fact, three quarters closer to, and. Of that, 220 trillion is domestic real estate, and 33 trillion is commercial, and 27 trillion is agricultural. So, in all of those ways, land is still absolutely at the foundation of capitalism, even in its most complex 21st century dynamic financial variety, because it's where we live, it's what feeds us, and ultimately, you know, even a cell phone tower needs somewhere to stand. So now I want to actually drag us back to the headlines because uh, I said at the top, this has been a really busy week uh, of economic news. And so I thought we would try to fit in two news data points. I know that's breaking the rules, but, you know, while we're breaking rules, might as well break a second because the number I had in mind is actually a question mark. Um, That's because uh, I wanted to talk about the rise of interest rates in the United States after a big announcement this week by the head of the Fed, Jerome Powell. Now, he didn't say exactly that he was going to raise interest rates, but he did say that he was pretty sure he was going to start tapering off some of the activities the Fed has been up to to prop up the economy. Participants generally view that so long as the recovery remains on track, a gradual tapering process that concludes around the middle of next year is likely to be appropriate. And that has people saying that kind of rise in interest rates is inevitable next year. Um, We just don't know by how much. Adam, can you first explain what exactly the Fed is up to and uh, how does that help determine interest rates in the first place? It's a it's a really complicated question. And I like the fact that you said help determine interest rates because the range of factors that shape interest rates is vast. I mean, in fact, there's lots of different interest rates long term, short term for private debt, for of different grades, higher and lower ratings for government debt, which we often call sovereign debt, and different currencies. But what, what the Fed's been doing is buying relatively long dated US government debt treasuries above all 10 year treasuries. And the aim is by raising their price to reduce the effective interest rate, the yield that they command. The, the, the way to think about this is that if you buy a bond, just for sake of argument, that has a face value of $100 and a 2% interest coupon, so it pays $2 a year, then you're getting a 2% yield on that $100 investment. Now, if you take an extreme example, and we were in a situation where to get that bond, you had to pay, say, $200, then your $2 in coupon would yield only 1%. So we would have, by means of levering up the price of the bond, have reduced the yield and the interest rate from 2 to 1%. And that's essentially what the Fed's trying to do. It's buying tens of billions of dollars of treasuries every month, squeezing bond prices up and interest rates down. And you do that, first of all, and they started doing this in earnest during the crisis in 2020, to reassure the holders of treasuries and to make sure that they carry on holding them, because you don't want them selling them all at once, because that would drive the price down and the interest rate up. And then you continue doing this because you want to keep interest rates down to help the economy along, to help the recovery. And you also want to squeeze investors who are looking for a return, looking for some kind of yield into riskier investments like equities, like new business uh, ventures that could actually help to drive economic growth. Okay, so that sounds good to me. Why why not just keep that program going? I mean, what's the downside of, of, of keeping uh, that kind of program? Well, well, if you did this on a truly huge scale forever, 
um, as they've been doing in Japan pretty much or Europe recently, you can actually find yourself running out of eligible debt to buy. Only a tiny fraction, for instance, of German government debt trades openly anymore. And the same is true for many 10 years of Japanese debt, because it's all now on the coffers of the central bank. And if the market is dominated by central banks, there's, there's not much point in trying to game it anymore. So really, as it were, we, we end private business in this realm of finance. And that's a major shift to initiate. We're a long way away from that in the United States. But what you're doing and what the Fed is acutely conscious of doing is, in a sense, politicizing, putting within the control of the discretion of a group of decision makers, one of the most basic signals in the economy, the medium term, long term interest rate. And more concretely and immediately, what they're worried about right now and what they've been discussing and what Powell is talking about is simply the question of whether they are, in fact, perhaps adding too much stimulus to the U.S. economy at this particular moment. Yeah, I mean, basically, from what I understood, Powell is saying he doesn't think that uh, he needs to be buying these bonds anymore. If progress continues broadly as expected, the committee judges that a moderation in the pace of asset purchases may soon be warranted. Should we interpret this as saying that the economy is recovered from the pandemic? Are we in the clear? That's the question. And it's a trillion dollar question. And it's argued and debated over every single minute of every single day in the markets and in the Fed. What the Fed committed itself to doing was continuing these measures, asset purchases, buying treasuries, buying mortgage-backed securities, until the labor market was recovered. That's the thing. That's really the test here. And, and it's a big shift historically that monetary policy is being set with regard to the labor market. In other words, factors which affect regular folks, working people up and down the United States. In fact, it's a social and racial justice issue uh, until even those on low pay and minority workers um, are back in demand in the workforce. The Fed has committed itself essentially to continuing support. It's quite clear and they've made explicit the fact that the unemployment rate, for instance, for black men is part of the dashboard of factors that they consider in their decision making. So what Powell is telling us is that the Fed is increasingly satisfied that that condition of high employment is being reached. And that would then be the moment to take the foot off the gas. I guess I would want to end by trying to tie these two data points together. Uh, I mean, when Jerome Powell makes this announcement, does he have things like Evergrande in mind and that big potential bankruptcy? I mean, is he basically saying that kind of turbulences like this in China, whether they're American or they're happening somewhere else? I mean, is this no reason to panic? I mean, are we basically just, uh, this is all just a normal part of the uh, international economy, nothing to see here? Well, let's be clear. I mean, if anything like Evergrande was happening in the United States, the Fed would not be talking in the terms that it is. They, they would be at panic stations. And I'm sure the People's Bank of China, China is. I mean, and the Fed isn't going to say it out loud, but it is definitely keeping an eye on the global situation right now, as are all of the other internationally relevant financial institutions. It won't say it out loud because, of course, it's not part of its mandate to monitor the Chinese economy. The Fed is a national central bank, but it's perfectly well aware that it has a global role. All over the world, people borrow in dollars. And for that reason, all over the world, they care about American interest rates. Even Chinese real estate developers borrow in dollars, despite the fact that the country is flush with savings. It's still sometimes efficient to do that kind of deal. And as we know, Evergrande has that 20 billion outstanding. So when the Fed tightens, it does send shivers through the world economy. So everyone knows about these connections and the markets are fully factoring them in and have been discussing little else now for months Evergrande is far too far gone, frankly, to in any case, right? I mean, its interest rates are now in the teens, if not higher. But emerging market central bankers have been tracking this for, for months now, and they've been anticipating the Fed move, and they've been tightening their own interest rates in expectation. And the real question, I think, is how big countries uh, like Brazil are going to fare. It's the biggest economy in Latin America, 211 million people. It's struggling with the aftermath of the pandemic. It has a lot of debt that it needs to roll over. Volatile populist president. And it's distinctly vulnerable right now to an interest rate shock. So uh, let's hope, frankly, that we're not doing a ones and twos segment about Brazil uh, anytime soon. Well, you know, from your mouth to Bolsonaro's ears, I hope. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but... 
Okay, we will uh, we will leave it there and be right back. Welcome back to Ones and Twos Foreign Policies Economics Podcast. We're going to shift now to our data point beyond the headlines. That's something that Adam came across in his reading or his uh, online surfing that somehow says something about the world we live in today. And today we're talking about trains, it looks like. Really, really fast trains. That was the sound of our next data point, which is 357.2. That's the speed in miles per hour of the fastest conventional train ever. It was recorded back in 2007, and the reason we're talking about it right now is that the TGV, that train, had its first ever ride 40 years ago on September 27th. The TGV is a French train, and uh, it's something that the French these days just take for granted. You can get on the train in Paris, be at the port city of Marseille in three hours. If you tried that with a car, it would take you eight hours over 500 miles of roads. It's the kind of infrastructure that the United States could only dream of having these days, even if, if the Biden administration passes its infrastructure bill. So uh, let's figure out how France managed to achieve this in the first place. Adam, how did the TGV get started? Rapid train travel was um, because, you know, trains are the backbone of European transport. And Europeans began to experiment with quite high speed trains, 200 kilometers an hour, 130, 140 mile an hour trains uh, running in Germany just before World War II. The fastest train service between Hamburg and Berlin was canceled with the outbreak of the war. They were going at 200 kilometers an hour. And so after the war, as competition intensifies between rail and road, and then increasing the air travel as well. The train folks really need to up their game. And there's there's a push across the world, really, to try and raise the speed. And the people that break through first are not actually the French, but the Japanese. And that's, I think, really what shot the French into action. You might not think of Japan as the obvious leader here, but in fact, in the giant conurbation that stretches from Tokyo to Osaka, there are 45 million people who in the 50s were still on quite modest levels of income. Japan is an oil importing country and wanted to avoid doing that. And so with World Bank help, believe it or not, they set about building the first bullet train, which was uh, shown to the public in time for the Tokyo Olympics in 1964. And frankly, the envy of the rest of the world, going over 200 kilometers an hour, 230, 240, running on electricity, which could be generated from coal. But, and this is the crucial thing, where had the Japanese gone to get the technology for that train? They obviously have a proud engineering tradition themselves, but the rail engineering lab that they went to in the 50s was the French Railway Systems Lab. Um, The SNCF, the French National Rail Company, was nationalized in 1937 by the socialist government of the day. And they had a a high-speed rail lab, which the Japanese much admired. And when the Japanese set the new pace for the world in the 60s, the French decided, as it were, to catch up, started developing very sophisticated high-speed trains, initially using gas turbines, And then when the oil price shock hit in 73, converted those to electric engines. The problem with high-speed rail is not just the engine and the power, it's actually keeping the things on the track. So you need to optimize the track, you need to develop new signaling systems. And so by the early 1980s, in 1981, in September, they were ready to launch this record-breaking train. What you're describing sounds like something more than just an infrastructure project. This sounds like a whole tech startup like something out of Silicon Valley. I mean, I guess Americans don't normally think of the French as the the, the most technologically advanced or on the frontier of new innovations. But is this something we're just getting wrong about France? Uh, Maybe maybe this is a whole different approach to technology that Americans just aren't familiar with? Probably both. But um, absolutely, you know, France is one of the high tech hubs of modern engineering um, in in the entire world. I mean, it has an unrivaled nuclear fleet, admittedly adopting an American nuclear technology on the whole. 
France was a great pioneer of aviation. In World War I, um, American flyers more often than not fly American aircraft. George Patton rode into battle in World War I in a French tank. The French army supplied the American army in World War I with its artillery, the 75 millimeter cannon. So France was in fact an en- a powerhouse of modern engineering so it's no surprise at all that uh, it should be taking this line. And it's a, it's a vision of French grandeur. It really is, as it were, the idea of the grand projet. So the, the large scale project is something that the French state consistently pushes. In fact, if the Europeans in general have an inferiority complex, it's not about large scale technology, nuclear colliders and things like that, where in many respects they can be ahead of the Americans. It's in the startup culture, the small scale technological development where they have historically tended to lag. So all this raises the question of how far this remarkable TGV technology has spread. I mean, obviously, it has not spread to the United States. Uh, you take the Amtrak, uh, it tops out at 150 miles per hour. That's less than half the speed of the TGV that uh, we're, we're, we're talking about. Um, but There must be other countries that want this kind of super fast train network. Uh, Is the technology spreading to those places or is there something getting in the way? Well, I think amongst advanced economies right now, one would have to say the United States is the exception. If you look at other rich countries, they almost all do have this option. But America is the great exception. The thing is, it's not so much simply the trains themselves, the locomotives and the the carriages, as building the track. Because to operate trains safely at this kind of speed, you need dedicated track. It has to be smooth, has to be seamless. It has to be on massive foundations, unlike the timber sleepers that are still used on many American railway lines. And for that, you need basically planning permission. You need to be able to go and cut across property rights and cut huge paths through major cities to be able to lay these lines, which makes them controversial and difficult to do. It took the Germans ages to commission a system as as fast as the the French one. But once they are running, they are absolutely phenomenal because the lines are dedicated smooth track and you can sit in a train going at 300 kilometers an hour faster than a Ferrari or a Porsche on the autobahn with your coffee barely wobbling. It doesn't tremor. You can sit with a laptop and a, a cup of coffee next to it and the cup of coffee is not disturbed as your train powers along. And the whole thing is driven by renewable energy. The whole thing can be driven by a windmill or a solar panel. It's a truly staggering technology that has proved incredibly difficult for the Americans to implement and adopt. China adopted German technology, basically. The South Koreans have French technology. The Japanese technology has been borrowed in many places around the world. Those are the the big three pioneers. But it's quite common now in rich countries. So you mentioned China's remarkable high-speed train network. Uh, I mean, did they manage that by borrowing technology from places like France? Or are they really making breakthroughs of their own when it comes to train technology? It is reputed to have been one of the more egregious thefts of intellectual property the Chinese have engaged in. They they, they bought a a Siemens high-speed train and and then moved on quite quickly. And this is one of the real sore spots for Germany uh, uh, along their own lines. Where I think the Chinese have been real pioneers is in track laying. It's well worth Googling this because the Chinese have some absolutely extraordinary machines for track laying. Because if you're going to build 30,000 kilometers of track in the way that they have, what you need is not, as it were, lots of trains to run on it so much as the machines to build it with. And they they have these extraordinary sort of rolling factories that that process down the railway line, laying the welded seamless steel tracks ahead of themselves as they progress. It's it's, they're absolutely extraordinary, like giant sort of um, centipedes. So that's, I think, where the Chinese have really pioneered. The World Bank did a study of their track laying costs. And it's, of course, it's easier to buy land in China for the authorities and all of that reduces the cost compared to doing the deal in the United States. But their technologies of track laying are simply out of this world. Yeah, that really does sound amazing. I guess you don't normally think of that as a passenger. There are machines behind the machines you're riding on. The fundamental difference to understand about the European and American railway systems and the Chinese one as well, in fact, is that America's passenger railway system looks like a bust. I mean, it's dilapidated, it's old fashioned, it's slow, it's uncomfortable. You cannot safely drink a cup of coffee next to your laptop on the Acela going at any kind of speed. Don't try that at home, folks. 
But America's railway system as a freight operating system is second to none. And this is part of why it's difficult to get priority for high speed passenger rail systems in the US is that the big railway companies in the US are all about freight. They're not about passengers. And by contrast, the Chinese case is an extraordinary example of innovation and technology for passenger service, for high quality passenger service. But the Chinese freight rail system is far less well developed. And so the main mode of transport for logistics in China are, in fact, long columns of trucks. The largest traffic jams in the world ever recorded are in the districts coming in and out of the great coal mining areas of China, uh, where you just have nose to tail for hundreds and hundreds of miles of trucks backed up. So the American story is is more is not not you know not everything meets the eye here. It's actually a system optimized for low cost freight rather than high quality high speed personal transport. Obviously, with a view to decarbonization, this is something that we need to get over. And unfortunately, it is true that even the most optimistic bids by the Biden administration for large scale investment in Amtrak fall far short of what we would need for America to come close to matching, let alone leap ahead of its peer advanced economies in this area. Okay, there you have it. I guess the next time you're sitting on a slow, shaky Amtrak train, you can take solace in the thought that somewhere out there on the American plains, there's a well-functioning freight system working. You're just not on it. And that'll do it for today's Ones and Twos, Foreign Policies Economics Podcast. I'm Cameron Abadi. And I'm Adam Twos. Ones and Twos is written and produced by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos. Rob Sachs and Laura Rossbrow tell them, edit our episodes. If you want to learn more about what we're talking about, check out the links from today's podcast at our website, foreignpolicy.com. If you have ideas for episodes or data points, let us know. Reach out to us on Twitter or just write us an email at podcasts at foreignpolicy.com. Also, make sure to subscribe to the podcast and write a review. Those really make a difference. Thank you. And we will be back in your feed next week.